So I'm building a nation. <clears throat> uh, in all relationships, when I say relationships, I mean in marriage, I mean in friendships, uh, there's interaction. For things to work in a marriage, you have to be on one accord. In friendships, you have to be on one accord. You can't build nothing meaningful with division. All right. Let's start off. Amos chapter 3. The book of Amos chapter 3 and verse 3. Can two walk together except they be agreed? Somebody explain to me. Somebody explain to me. Stand up. Uh, no, no, sorry. Let's say, you know, I want to get married. My check. Let's say, um, you know, you want to get married or something, and you believe, oh, you know, Christ is only sent to die for the Israelites. But, you know, the woman believes she's sent to die for everyone. Can y'all get married together? It's not going to work out. Why? Because that's, unless we're on the same page, that's how division comes. What do you mean? As in somebody help. Shalom, Bishop. Shalom, leadership. Uh, the best example I could give can two walk together unless they agreed. Um, I'll give you a Northern Kingdom example. Um, they used two animals to pull a carriage down in Mexico. If those two animals do are not on the same accord and walk in the same direction. They cannot walk together. If one wants to stand and the other one wants to go this way or that way, they will not work. Only when they move together in unison and one accord will they achieve what they're trying to do. So along the lines of what you're saying, what I'm talking about is, he said, he used the word, I'm sorry. Hey, can we, I want, you, I want us to invest in one of those mics who's Bobby Brown. I don't want to hold a mic anymore. Bobby Brown mic. Oh, the Pell mic. We got a little Pell mic in here? We have one here now? It's called DeMont Prerogative 2000. Yes, Absolutely. The byproduct of his division, if they can't move together, the byproduct of division is contention, strife. Can two walk lest they be agreed? The answer is no. You cannot walk together unless you agree on something. That goes in all relationships. Friendships, <coughs> marriages, <coughs> Business, you have to be on the same page. Very basic concept. Now, what does this have to do with building a nation? John 13. St. John chapter 13, and I want to start at verse 33. The book of St. John chapter 13 and verse 33. Correct. Little children. Yet a little while I am with you. Ye shall seek me. And as I said unto the Jews, whether I go, ye cannot come. So now I say to you, a new commandment I give you, give unto you, that ye love one another, as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. Now listen to what he says. Little children, <clears throat> yet a little while I am with you. He said, I'm going to be with you for a little more, for a little time longer. He says, ye shall see me, and as I say unto you, and as I say unto the Jews, whither I go, you cannot come. He said the same thing to the Jews, whether I go, you cannot come. Where did they, where, okay, sidebar from the class. Where did he say that to the Jews? Soldier? Very good. Go to the book of John 735. The book of John, chapter 7 and verse 35. Then said the Jews among themselves, Whether will he go, that we shall not find him? Will he go unto the dispersed among the Gentiles and teach the Gentiles? They thought he was talking about going to the dispersed amongst the Gentiles to teach the Gentiles, meaning the scattered Israelites. That's what they thought. So he said, he said this, so let's go back. He said, he said to the Jews, now he's saying to them, Where I go, you will not find me. 
Verse 34. Verse 34. A new commandment I give unto he you. He said, and being that I'm going, there's a new commandment that I'm giving to you. Read on. That ye love one another. Stop. What is that telling you <clears throat> about them? Shema. Oh, no, no. That's it. this young brother right here. Don't worry about a mic. Just loud. Um, that's true, too, but that's not what it's talking. Yes, that's true, but it's here saying. What is he? Okay. Repeat that. Just leave the, just leave the northern kingdom, southern kingdom out. Okay. Just say. They didn't know how to love their brothers like right. they were supposed to. Right. So your answer wasn't wrong, but I don't want to bring uh, southern, northern kingdom involved. He was saying, I'm writing a new command un commandment unto you. It wasn't a new commandment. It's always been around. We just wasn't practicing it. So he said, this is brand new to you, that you love one another. So he says, a new commandment I write, un I, a new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another. Read on. <clears throat> As I have loved you, that ye also love one another. He said, I left this example. I'm not asking you to love for your brother, but I'm, I'm asking you to love your brother as I loved you. And a good leader is never going to ask somebody to do something they themselves will not do. Don't follow, don't follow nobody like that. Read on. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples. Now watch what he says. By if. No, by this. By what? Just blurt it out. By loving each other, all men shall what? Know that ye are my disciples. If it says, I'm sorry, Judah. He's saying that it will be apparent to all men that you're truly following me if if you have love one to another. So we want to be set apart. We want to be different. We want to be viewed different. All people, all nations shall know these are the believers and follow Christ if you love your brother. That's something hard for us to do. As a people. Because we all have our own ways and whatever. And you put people together in marriages. She does things one way. He does things one way. They got to find that middle ground, which is what? No. Which is what? Forget. Let me change the word. Let me use the word middle ground because that might denote 50-50. We have to find our common ground, which is what? The Bible. That's what we have to find. So you take two people together in marriage or in friendship, the common denominator is the word of God. He said, all nations are going to look around and say, these must be the followers of Christ if you apply love for your brethren and your sister. In other words, it's work. It's, he, it's easy to hate, to have envy, malice, strife. Those are easy things to do. It's harder for us to keep the commandments. Why? I'm going to say it because we're grieved by God's words. That's why. Because we still got our own minds to do things the way we want to do it. So read that verse again. Verse 35. Oh. Sorry. I almost forgot. Go ahead. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if ye have loved one to another. Simon Peter said unto him, Lord. Whither goest thou? Jesus answered him. Whether I go, thou canst not follow me. Follow me now, but thou shalt follow me afterwards. Peter said unto him, Lord, why cannot I follow thee now? I will lay down my life for thy sake. Jesus answered him, Wilt thou lay down thy life for my sake? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, The cock shall, crow, the cock shall not crow, Till thou hast denied me thrice. So verse 36, it says, uh, verse 35. But this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. Simon Peter said unto him, Lord, whither thou goest? Jesus answered him, Whither I go, thou cannot, thou canst not follow me now. He said, Where I'm going right now, you can't come right now. He said, But thou shalt follow me afterward. He said, But afterwards, you're gonna go where I'm going. Indeed, you're gonna drink of this cup. You're going to get it. But right now, it ain't your time. So what was Christ doing? Christ was going to sacrifice himself for the betterment of his people. And he told John, uh, Simon Peter, yeah, one day you're going to do the same thing. You are going to sacrifice yourself for the betterment of people. But it ain't for right now. Is it the same chapter or chapter 15? There's no greater love. 15, right? 
15, 13, is that it? That's yes, a 15, 13. Ah, for, verse 12. Verse 11. The book of John. No, I'm sorry. I wasn't going to read this. Uh, verse 9. Chapter 15 and verse 9. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. He says, if you keep my commandments, you will abide and stay in my love. Read on. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be filled, but might be full. Now watch what he says. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you. He says, if you do not continue in these things, my joy will not remain in you. So watch out. Let's read on. This is my commandment, that ye love one another. He said, and this is my commandment. This is what I want. You want my joy to remain in you? That you love one another. Read on. As I have loved you. The same way I loved you. Read on. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay his life, lay his life for his friends, lay it's, down his life for his friends. It says there's no greater love you can have than one laying down his life for for his friend. What kind of friend is that that he would lay his life down for? He says, fulfill ye my joy. Read on. Verse 14. Ye are my friends, if ye do whatsoever I command you. He says, ye are my friends, if you do whatsoever is commanded of you. So if you want to be a friend of Christ, a friend of God, he said, this is my commandment, that you love one another. He said, this is a new commandment, because evidently you forgot what to do. Watch this. Go back to John 13, verse 37. John chapter 13 and verse 37. Peter said unto him, Lord, why cannot I follow thee now? I will lay down my life for thy sake. He said, well, Lord, why can't I follow you now? Because I lay down my life for you. Read on. Jesus answered him. Wilt thou lay down thy life for my sake? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, the cock shall not crow till thou hast denied me thrice. He said, the cock will not crow till thou hast denied me thrice. What is he telling him? Man, you ain't ready. You saying it with your lips. You saying you have that love for me, but you're not that spiritual lover yet to have that love for me. He said, I just told you, a new commandment I write unto you. If it wasn't new for you, Peter, he'd have said, a new commandment for the rest of you, but Peter already got it. He said, all the disciples, a new commandment I got for all of you. You don't understand what love really is about. Now, the point behind Christ laying down his life for us was for what? Was for what? It, to demonstrate love. You know me, I don't know how to ask questions. That the nation of Israel can exist today. Because without him dying, we wouldn't be here. There'd be not one of us on this earth. His life was to keep the nation of Israel on this earth. That had to have been the sacrifice that had to be made so we can exist. Deuteronomy 4. So in building a nation, relationships, sacrifices will be made. Christ was affectionate. He was affectionate. He wasn't a one-sided man. He loved his people. But anyway, here you go. They shall know you are my disciples. I'm going to get back to it. Uh, Deuteronomy 4 and 5. The book of Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 5. Behold, I have taught you statutes and judgments, even as the Lord my God commanded me, that ye should do so in the land whether ye go to possess it. Keep therefore and do them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations. He says, in you applying these commandments, they're going to know you are my disciples. If you keep these commandments, because this is your wisdom and what? 
For this is your wisdom and understanding in the sight of the nations. This is your wisdom and understanding in the sight of the nations. Just now, from this was written to now, fast forward to today. You know we don't apply that because we have enmity, strife. We're recorded on TV. They watch us on whatever shows they have now where we're at their fight, Atlanta Housewives and they freaking fighting or whatever they're doing. We lost this. Said, so this is your wisdom in the sight of the nations. So read that verse one time. Verse six. Keep therefore and do them. For this is your wisdom in the, this is your wisdom and understanding in the sight of the nations, which shall hear all these statutes and say, surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. Read. For what nation is there so great who hath God so nigh unto them as the Lord our God is in all things that we call upon for him? Right. It says, for what, for what nation is there so great who hath God so nigh unto them? No nation is so great that has God nigh to him. And us having God, God nigh unto us, he gave us laws on how to deal with one another. No nation could rule unless they have one thing in common, their self-preservation. That's where their relationship is based off of. So with us, we'll see one of our brothers get murdered in the street. <laughs> we came to come on a common ground on how to deal with it. We was a Ferguson. I forgot, the, well, I forgot where he got killed with Skittles or whatever he had in his hands. Candy, he had a grown man lay down the street with a Skittle thing. Was it Skittle? Yeah, well, whatever. It was Trayvon. So somebody lay in the street. They marked it around him. And he just lay in the street with, a, with the Skittles in his hand and a drink. Another man is marching. Somebody got a candle. Other one's crying. <laughs> Division. We don't do it. We all over the place. Somebody's out there trying to get you to sign up for voting. And then you got the Israelites in the corner screaming, keep God's commandments. So back to St. John's 13. Relationships in building a nation. I want a new commandment I write unto you. The book of St. John, chapter 13 and verse 34. A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. That was the commandment he gave. Philippians. Book of Philippians chapter 2. I'm going to start with verse 1. The book of Philippians chapter 2 and verse 1. <clears throat> if there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and, and mercies. So, so if there be if there be, therefore, any consolation in Christ. What does the word consolation mean? Can I get a water, please? What does the word consolation mean? Anybody? Look it up. It means award or prize. Something else? Comfort. comfort. Is that the comfort there? Yes. Comfort. Compassion, those are synonyms that go with the word consolation. Is this if there's any? So let's let's change that. Let's use the word comfort. Like give me the hit, hit synonyms. All right, it's loading. Okay. So meanwhile, while it's loading, it says let's use the word comfort. Let's change it out. Read it. Philippians chapter 2 verse 1. If there be therefore any comfort in Christ, if any comfort of love. They use the word comfort anyway. <laughs> That's the same, same thing. Compassion. Let's say compassion. Yeah, compassion. Pity. Let's use the word sympathy. Let's use the word compassion. It says if there what? If there be therefore any compassion in Christ, if any comfort of love, if 
any fellowship of the spirit. If any, if you have any compassion, any comfort in Christ, in looking at the example he ha- he made, he died for us. If you have any fellowship of spirit. Show me in the scriptures where any man ever did it by himself. Show me. It's not it's not in the scriptures. Abraham, no, Lot. David, no, Jonathan or Saul. Maccabees, his brothers. Name one. Joshua, was he by himself? Elijah, was he by himself? No. Two is better than one. He says, any fellowship of spirit, read on. If any bowels and mercies. Any bowels and mercies. If you have this, the bowels of mercy, when you show mercy, meaning what? In relationships, sometimes you have to show mercy for the overall good. When Christ was being crucified, he said, forgive them for they don't know what they do. And yet they even had to apologize. Just forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. God, don't, God, do not lay this to their charge. In making that statement when he said, forgive them for, no, for they know not what they do, what is he trying to do? Here we go. Me and Judah got a problem. I said, forgive me. What am I trying to do? Come on, please. We're friends. We're close. I did something to him, and I said, forgive me. What am I trying to do? Make a man join back together. All right? That's what Christ was doing. He said, God, don't lay to the charge. If there's any bowels of mercy, read on. Verse 2. Verse 2. Fulfill ye my joy. He said, fulfill my joy. What was the joy of Christ? We read it earlier. What was his joy? That we love one another. That's his joy. He said, I died on the cross so you all can be one back together. He didn't die for there to be a separation. He's, he's dying to unify us. And in us unifying, what brings about, what comes from that? With us unifying back together. We come back as a nation and we what? And we rule. We won't rule separate. We'll get to that in a second. So fulfilling my joy. Read on. That ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. He says, fulfill his joy. This is his commandment. Fulfill my joy. If you have any bowels of mercy in you, if you have any consolation in what Christ did, if you have any comfort in love, any fellowship of the Spirit, you're going to come together. Put aside differences. Come together. You'll be fulfilling his joy. Everybody understand that? Absolutely. Shalom, Israel. Most high Christ bless. Happy Sabbath. Please pardon my delay. Um, Excellent, excellent topic that the bishop is going over. And I really like the example that the bishop just presented as far as making amends with your brother based upon the comforts in Christ. Christ is giving us an outline on how to be able to do these things in sincerity, how to be able to do these things uprightly. And that's one of the things that we have to think about when it comes to when those trials happen in our lives. Sometimes we can do things in the truth, upright or in sincerity. Sometimes we could do things just to check a box. I'll give you a prime example. Let's say I turn around and I punch as an eye in the face. Not going to punch you, bro. Forgive me, all right? <laughs> if I punch Azaniah in the face, half his teeth is on the table. Everybody sees that I didn't punch Azaniah in the face. I don't want to tell Azaniah, hey, bro, you know, if there's something that I did to offend you, just forgive me. I know what I did. Half your damn teeth is on the table. Clearly, I've offended you, right? So, better for me to say, bro, you know what? I apologize, man. I know I'm the devil. I got the world on me. I got spirits. My spirit ain't right. I pray that you pray for me and that you please forgive me. 
then that creates a, a basis for another brother to look back and say, okay, you know what? This person really is trying to make amends. As and I will still have to forgive me either way, it, however I say it, but it is more inviting to be able to make that amends if, if I approach it a certain way. The scripture says a man that has friends must show himself friendly. So a lot of times through the abundance of words, when we speak it out of our heart, it will kind of give off a certain vibe in terms of, okay, is the goal to win my brother over or is it just to check a box? We don't want to do things just to check a box. We really want to be able to do it so that way we can have that love for one another in sincerity, if that makes sense. So I know, real quick about your teeth. Make sure you pay the dental bill, too. Cause if you ain't paying the dental bill, he ain't going to love you. Here's the thing. <laughs> he, he just, I'm sorry, but I got a bill. Here's the thing. Well, you do it, and you, then you go home, you text him, I'm sorry. Man, you just knocked my teeth out. You think you couldn't say, I'm sorry to my face? You couldn't talk to me? That's another way of we trying to get up out of not really dealing with it. But what you going to say, officer? I just wanted to add that the the statement that Captain Uzziah made is what the definition of repentance is. You can't just say, if I did something, I'm sorry. You have to acknowledge what you did, confess and forsake that, as it says in 1 Kings 8 about repentance. Conf you have to actually acknowledge what you did wrong, realize that what you did was wrong, and apologize about that particular thing, not just a blanket I'm sorry if I did anything, and you know whatever it might have been, that doesn't work like that. First Kings eight, um, forty. Let's just forty-seven. Can you read that, Judah? The book of First Kings, chapter eight, and verse forty-seven. If they shall bethink themselves in the land whither they were carried captives, and repent and make supplication unto thee. In the land of them that carried them captives, saying, we have sinned. So when you're apologizing to the Most High God, when you're bethinking yourself, you're going to say to the Most High that we have sinned. In order for you to know that what sin is, you have to know what the commandments are, because sin is what? The transgression of the law, right? So you have to say that you sin, meaning you know what the law is, read. We have sinned. And have done perversely. Now, the word perverse, if you look that up, is saying that you did something wrong and you know you did it wrong, but you did it anyway, despite the consequences. So you, you're acknowledging that you were in the wrong, that you, you're, you're the devil. Like <laughs> You're acknowledging how bad your offense really is. Read. We have committed wickedness. And, and so we have committed wickedness. So, so you really have to go in on yourself if you really are truly apologetic and repentant. You have to go in on yourself, not just, eh, it wasn't that bad, but if you want me to apologize, I'll do it. No, you have to see how wrong your error was in order for you to really forsake this sin. You can stop there. No, actually, then skip down to 49. Hold on, let me go back. I'm sorry. Why is, why is pulling it? Apologies. Uh, the scripture says, charity think if not her own. So sometimes in certain situations, maybe something doesn't directly bother you per se, but out of love that you have for your neighbor, you're looking inside of their lens. You're looking inside of, okay, well, how does it bother this person? Maybe you may have a certain type of spirit where something like that doesn't necessarily bother you. So when you're making that apology, you're not making it from your own perspective. Because if it's from your own perspective, it's just nothing. You just dust it off and it's... Oh, like, okay, the person is saying something, but they don't really care. You really want to make a genuine, concerted apology by saying, well, you know what? If I'm this person, how does this person process this? If I was in this person's shoes going through their situation, how would I think that this person would feel? And then that's how you extend the apology, because that's really loving your neighbor as yourself. 49. 1 Kings chapter 8. And verse 49. Then hear thou their prayers and their supplication in heaven, thy dwelling place, and maintain their cause. Because once you go through the proper steps at asking for forgiveness, whether it be, you know, giving, giving in that forgiveness from the most high, th that's the same manner in which you're supposed to be able to give forgiveness to your brother. That's when your prayer is really going to be heard. Because now you want forgiveness 
but you can't get forgiveness unless your brother is willing to forgive you. Or, excuse me, you're willing to forgive your brother. So it says, then hear thou thy prayer and their supplication in heaven. After you confess that you've sinned, that you've done perversely, that you've done wickedly. And that's when the Most High get, ends up forgiving you. Very good, very good. Let's go back, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, Philippians. The book of Philippians, chapter 2 and verse 2. Fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. What does it say, let what? Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. So he says, fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and one mind. Now this whole class is about building a nation through relationships. Can two walk lest they be agreed? Absolutely not. They cannot walk. You have to fulfill his joy. His joy is that you have love. You be like-minded. Care for one another. Let nothing be through done through strife or vain glory. As long as there's strife between brothers and sisters in the body, between us as a nation of people amongst each other, we will, we will stay in derision. We will not achieve the kingdom. The Lord is going to force us to learn to work together cohesively in one mind, one spirit, the Bible being the playing field in which we play from before we receive the kingdom. He's looking for us on this side to start figuring out that we need each other. That's what I said. You know, some other day I was watching news. My kids were showing me. Um, little Eden, my kid that was being bullied, get the find he was calling by what does he call him? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nigga. But anyway, in a matter of two days, they raised, they do some GoFundMe raised 60 grand for him. 60 grand. It, c trust me when I tell you something. There were some coons who sent money too, but for the most of them was his own people. He's a little thing. He was being bullied, and they learned to rally around him. A cop killed, let me tell you today, an a Edomite cop killing a Jake in the street is the best retirement move he can make. Because his house will get paid off, his kids will go to college, he'll be set for life. He'd better off killing one of us than working the 20 years. Because the minute he kills somebody, go fund me, they pay off his house. We are, if we walk in the commandments of God like this, the nation will say, I are wise and understanding people. Look how they navigate. Brothers won't be too afraid to stand up on their jobs for certain, certain things they should do. Colin Kaepernick stood up. Look, they ain't, Jake, they ain't trying to help that nigga, please. All the football, they should have been paid that dude. He should, be, he should be a hundred millionaire right now. One make the step, they all make the step. We work divisively. We don't have one mind, one spirit under Christ. But here's the point I want to get to. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. Let nothing, no relations, no interactions be done through strife or vain glory. Read on. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind. Let but in what? But in lowliness of mind. In relationships, whatever you want to call marriage, friendship, if each of us are walking in the lowliness of mind, in a spirit of humility, things are easily solved. It's not a strife spirit. It's not a vainglorious spirit. Read on. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Let each esteem others better than themselves. I'm telling you, these are the small building blocks in building back a nation up. It begins at the household with husband and wife. The first church is in the home. You get that cemented, rooted right. What will produce from that are children that will be doing the same thing. And then we'll come together collectively as a nation and we'll learn how to solve issues real quick. We won't let things linger. As long as we have that stuff lingering, we'll stay in these decrepit states. Read on. Verse 4. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. That's in relationships. Not, you don't look on your own things, but you're worried about the things of others. Isn't that the job? in a marriage for the husband to put himself aside for his wife 
Is that the relationship in the wife? To be up early, to prepare for the house, to have food, to sew clothes, to do things, to prepare for a husband, to be pleasing. He's worrying about her. She's worrying about him. The family is moving correctly. Christ died for us. Now Christ said the example is you're going to have to die for somebody. You've got to esteem somebody better than yourself. But I'm telling you something. That's the reason why they can't break the back of Islam. It's because then people, somebody say, you know what? We all talking, yeah, just finish eating goat. And I'm like, all right, I'm about to go strap this bomb up, and I'm going to go die for the rest of y'all right now. Love you, family. Love you, kids. And he's like, yeah, bye. And he go blows himself up. Then a few months later, he's like, you know what? I remember what, uh, what Abdul did. You know what? I'm going to do. You know, you can't fight people like that. You can't beat them at war. <laughs> you got you to change their mindset. Make them become, for the lack of a better word, niggards. Give them friggin' internet. Whatever crap they're doing now. Because you can't break an ideology. They all care. Somebody decided today I'm going to leave my family for the betterment of everybody else. That's why he lost that war to Kamikaze. Dude's taking plays of... I'm not saying nobody do that. Don't be stupid. But you know what I'm trying to say. <laughs> it's always a sacrifice. If you got a nation of people that's willing to sacrifice for others, you can't destroy them. No, nah, I'm sorry. No, nah, I'm sorry. No, nah, you'd be too busy fighting, saying sorry to each other. You, you don't even know who made the, who had the problem. I forgive you. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And we move on. No, nah, I'm sorry. Yeah, you're right. You are sorry. <laughs> read, read on. Verse five. Let this mind be in you. Let which, this what? Let this mind be in you. Let this mind be in you. Read on. Which was also in Christ Jesus. Which was uh, looking on the things of others. Read on. Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Listen, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with the Father. Now, he know he wasn't equal with God. But what is it saying that for? Read on. Verse 7. But made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant. And was made in the likeness of men. So now look, look what it says. Verse 6. Who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God. But made himself of no reputation and took upon himself the form of a servant. This is the kings of kings, lord of lords. Who could have called down legions of angels to fight. Who did not find it. What's the word I'm looking for? Not robbery to be equal with God as a power. But he dumbed himself down and came on the earth in the form of a servant as a man. For who? For us. He didn't have to do it. But he said, you know what? If this is what I got to do to keep this nation to exist, it's worth it. And then we got schisms and whatever that we can't move past. We can't solve it. Watch this. Read on. Verse 8. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore, God, hath, God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. Read on. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. Read. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God, the father. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. He says, now I read out for reason to get to this point. He says, wherefore, my beloved. As ye have always obeyed, Paul saying what I said, not in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. So whatever he, whatever he taught them about having the, the bowels of mercy, the, uh, the comfort of spirit, the consolation of Christ, the fellowship of spirit, fulfill the joy of being like-minded. He said, you don't obey not in my presence also. Or, or, you don't obey in my presence only. But much more in my absence, you obey this. 
What does it say then? Verse 12. Verse 12. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. He said you better work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Make sure that you fashion yourself after Christ. His example. Now watch. Read on. Verse 13. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. To will and his good pleasure is fulfilling my joy. Be like-minded to one to another. Read on. Do all things without murmurings. What? Do all things without murmurings and disputing. He said do all things without murmuring and disputing. That is not from God. That is sensual. It's not of the spirit. Murmuring. You cannot build a nation with people murmuring. Blah, blah, blah. You, can't, you can't build a nation with disputing. How can, you, how can two walk like they be agreed? If there is constant disputing, something is wrong. If you both believe, if all of us believe the same thing, this problem is going to rise, but it could be simply solved. Do you, think, do you think in Esau's army that they achieve what they achieve by murmuring and disputing? Flank left, everybody flanks left. Move forward, everybody moves forward. Halt, everybody halt. We do it, flank left. Why I got to listen to you? I'm my own man. We're not building anything like that. Reverse, what scripture is that? <laughs> what scripture is that? <laughs> no, you're trying to lord over me. And imagine you're being a lion in the house. Okay, we, I, I guess we're not going anywhere no soon. We're, I guess we got we to stay in this captivity for a little longer. Go ahead. Feel free. <laughs> this is the reason why, brothers and sisters, I want to make a real sincere point right now. I'm going to look at a lot of you. This is the reason why you have to have order in a church. Going back to what the bishop just said, right? When the army says go left, the army goes left. If the army general says go right, the people go right. If you don't have order, right? Like if you don't have, if you got 50 people and everybody, all of those 50 people have an equal footing, you're going to get 20 people saying go left, 30 people saying go right. People, Negroes is going to come out of the woodwork saying go straight. Other Negroes are going to come out the woodwork saying go backward. Negroes are going to pop out of nowhere and say go under the ground. You have to have, this is why you have to have order. You have to have someone that says, okay, out of 50 people, who can we entrust to tell us which direction we can go? Because we have enough common sense to know that if 50 people give 50 different opinions, we're not going no damn where. We'll have so much debate about whether to go light, right or left, we'll spend our damn day in the same place. We would have been better off just going left or right to listen to one man, but you're, now you're standing still. This is the reason why you must have order. So if brothers and sisters cannot extract from what we're, reason, we're reading, oh, this is the reason why there's elders ordained in a church. This is the reason why you have officers. This is the reason why you have aged sisters. If you don't understand... From that, the scriptures are showing you that the consolation in Christ, it hasn't moved your spirit yet to receive that. So all of this is really Christ's teachings. Christ is a man about order. Uh, uh, Captain, uh, verse 14. Uh, Green. Verse 14. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 14. Do all things without murmurings and disputings. Read. That ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation. So in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, I'm talking about Esau. If we walk in order without us murmuring against each other, disputing against each other, they'll say, ah, oh, what a wise and understanding people. But they can just flick on TV and watch us, and watch us just be in disassemble and disarray, arguing, murmuring, fighting. And they're looking and say, look, Billy Bob, look at them, look, look at them coons right there. Look at them. Meanwhile, 
We're supposed to be the sons of God. Fulfill ye my joy. Uh, verse 16. Verse 16. Oh, no, no, no. I'm sorry. You, which verse you just read? 15. Okay, 15 again. That ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world. We are supposed to shine as lights in the world. When a nation sees us, they're supposed to be afraid of us. These are disciplined people. Look how their women treat their men. Look how they talk to them with respect and reverence. Look how the children are. Look how they conduct themselves around each other. Look how they behave. And all that is just applying God's commandments. It's not no special, nothing other than God said, I set you apart as a special people. Do these laws and you'll see how you're going to be viewed. Christ said, I'm going to leave you, but I'm going to leave you with a new commandment because you never figured out before how to love one another. Read on. Verse 16. Holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ. That I what? That I may rejoice in the day of Christ. That he may rejoice in the day of Christ. That I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. He said, holding forth the word of life. Here. Holding forth, exalting, applying the word of life. I lost my place. There you go. That I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. I'm going to read 15 and 16 together. That ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye sign as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life, that I may, rejo uh, says, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain. So you will run this race in vain if there's murmuring and disputing, if you do not feel, fulfill his joy having love for one another. If there's schisms in the body, you will run this race for nothing. At the end, you no know, see God for my Issacharite brothers. You no know, see Dios. You will not, understand, will not. So you've been running, but you wasted your time. Because you weren't about nation building. Nation building cannot be built with murmuring and disputings. Nation building cannot be built on, I'm my own man. Even, even the crooked, wicked, perverse nations, one man down, they go back and, the Marines, they go back and grab their guy and try to, hey, like, let the nigga stay there. You never liked them anyway. Never liked them anyway. Uh, neither labored in vain. Verse seventeen. Verse seventeen. Yea, and if I be and I and if I be offered upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I joy and rejoice with you all. Ooh, read again. Yea, and if I be offered upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I joy and rejoice with you all. You know, somebody says, "Yea, and if I be offered upon the sacrifice." And service of your faith. To build your faith. If I have to give myself up for that. He says what? I joy and rejoice with you all. Esteeming others better than himself. Do you understand? I'm going to go back again. I always use this example. Do you understand Esau when he built this demonic kingdom? There was many of them unnamed to this day. All you hear about is George Washington and Tom. There's many of them that died to the building of this so their little demon seed can enjoy the fruits of today. A lot of them died coming off of ships here. A lot of them died in the middle of, the, in the middle of Georgia in the dead of winter fighting with a daggon rifle shoved in his neck. So their people can enjoy the fruits of it later on. So they were unified. Trust me, don't let it fool you. Don't think they weren't unified. They all had a common mission. We're going to take all this over. We're going to kill every last one of them that we can kill. And everything here is going to belong to us. Do you all agree? Yes. Okay. I'm leading the charge. And they said, we're following you. And they went about their business. 
and their nation grew and they took over. What were we doing? Christmas addicts, we getting shot with them. Some of us began to think we're going to vote our way out of it. We're going to march our way out of it. We were not unified. And when we try to unify, we unified on under all the wrong things. Here's what we're going to unify under Christ. And we're going to get to that in a second. Uh, what verse was that, Judah? Verse 17. Why did I go to 1 Corinthians 16? There's a thought I had. Okay, I'll get back to that. Good, read on. Verse 17. Yea, and if I be offered upon the sacrifice of your f- and service of your faith, I joy and rejoice with you all. For the same cause also do ye joy and rejoice with me. Read on. But I trust in the Lord Jesus. Excuse me. But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timotheus shortly unto you. Look at look, look at order here. Look at the building a nation. These were the churches that was being built back in those days. The Church of Philippian, Corinth, Galatia, Laodicea. All these churches are being built. The seven churches of Asia Minor. What was, Paul, what was Paul doing? Paul was giving instruction. And he says, I'm going to send Timotheus unto you soon, shortly. Paul was able to instruct men where to go. I need you to go here and do this work. It wasn't a mind like, but why do I got to go? That's not I want to go. I wanted to go. I wanted to go to Babylon. I said, go to, take your ass to freaking over here. I said, that's what I need you at. You get a service, you're like, listen, we're shipping you out to Guam. Guam? I wanted to go to Hawaii. <laughs> you both say that Esau army, boy. He will not say the Esau army. Yeah, I'm going to roll with Titus. No. <laughs> I didn't say I need you to creep. Well, he said, he said I'm going to send you Timothy shortly, Timothy is shortly unto you. Read on. Excuse me, verse 19. 19. But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy shortly unto you, that I also may be of good comfort when I, when I know your state. When I know, he said, I'm going to send to you, and when I find out, Timothy, Timothy will tell me about your state. Read on. For I have no man, for I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state. He said, I have no man like this that's like-minded, that's like this, that thinks just like me, that's going to have no more care for your state. Read on. For all seek their own. For what? For all seek their own. He said, all seek their own. He said, "That's the, you don't need that. Everybody got their own. I'm my own man, my own mind. He said, no, 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 no. That's not going to work. He said, I got to send this man who's going to do my bidding, which is God's bidding. That's how we build. He said, I ain't send nobody else because everybody else got their own agenda. They got their own mind. That's what he says. Too many, too many Indians are not enough... Ch- too many chiefs and not enough Indians. Read on. For I seek, for all seek their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ. Read on. But ye know the proof of him, that as a son with the father, he hath served with me in the gospel. He said, but you know the proof of him, because like a son with the father. He says, as a son with the father, he served with me in the gospel. Read on. Him, therefore, I hope to send presently. So soon as I shall see how it would go with, with me, but I trust in the Lord that I also myself shall come shortly. He said, and then I, myself will come shortly. So like I said earlier, a good leader never asks anybody to do something that he himself will not do. I keep on telling you, do not follow people like that. You'd be, you're a clown if you follow somebody asking you to do something that he won't do. Read. Yet I supposed it necessary to send to you uh, Epid- Epid- somebody. That's it. Ephroditus, my brother and companion in labor and fellow soldier, but your messenger, but your messenger, and he that ministered to you my wants. And he shall minister to you what I want. Is there more behind it? Yes, read on. For he longed after you all and was full of heaviness because that ye had heard that he had been sick. And he longed after you, it says, and he longed after you all. And was full of heaven because the chief heard that he had been sick. He longed after you because you heard he was sick. The man was sick and was worrying about you finding out that he was sick. If that's not the spirit of 
Humility. He said, I wonder how they're going to take it to know that I'm sick. It's going to tear them up. Now, he's, he's sick and he's troubled by it. That you would even find out he was sick. Read on. Verse 27. For indeed he was sick, nigh unto death. Read. But God had mercy on him. And not on him only, but on me also. He said, God had mercy on him by saving him. But not on him only, but also on me. Meaning, if he were to die, the grief that it would have caused Paul was so great. He said, God, thank you for saving him because it saved me heartache. Now, you understand that? When, when you start talking like that, then it kind of makes sense with a man laying down his life for a brother. Because he's saying, the pains of you dying is too much for me to even bear. God, thank you. You had mercy on me. Now, I just saved him. But it was mercy for me, God. Because I don't know if I could have. This, this is a fellow laborer in this harvest. This is all we have. I'm saying right here. I'm not getting here. This is all we got right here. How the hell are we going to have contention in here and be us? Come on, you got to be joking. Let's, that's out there we're trying to tackle. They're supposed to see us in here and see a unified people. Problem solved, move on. We're, bi we're nation building. Not harboring and holding on to resentment. Not harboring and holding on to strife and malice. You will not grow thereby. Hold that. Forgot the scripture. First Peter 2. I'm sorry. We come right back here. First Peter 2. First Peter's two. Okay. Where's Peter's at? Verse one. The book of First Peter's chapter two and verse one. Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings. Lay that aside. Read on. As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word. But as newborn babes, you better desire this Bible. Read on. That ye may grow thereby. That you can grow. So if you don't lay aside malice, guile, hypocrisies, envies, evil speaking, and desire the sincere milk of the word, you will not grow thereby. You have to lay aside malice and hatred that you might grow. Envy, malice, hatred, those things is what cause division. That is not nation building tools. The nation sit back and said, look at them niggas. <laughs> Boy, look at them. They're about to fight because they're racing to get that PlayStation 4 or those Jordans. Look, they open the door. Look at the nigga. Look at him. He kicks the other. Look at him. They fight for the box. Yeah, they're not going out of camp. They're going to be in captivity for a long time. The door needs to open and nobody needs to be there. You worry about... You, I would love to see somebody kick somebody over for a Bible. No, I'm joking. But no, you're going to fight over a pair of sneakers. <laughs> you're fighting to spend $200. Officer. No, no, no. They fighting over the names. Yep. Right. Yep. Now they're yep. fighting over the Arabs. They... Yep. You know, listen, I'm glad you made that point because trust me, the, the powers that be that know that we're the Israelites, they'll look and see the division amongst us in the camps and look, they're fighting over his name. Yeah, Yahweh, Yahweh, Shah, yo, uh, Yahoo, whatever they want to say, his name. Look at them. Look at them. They're like, look at these fools. Look at them. They're done. You still got, yeah, we still, we got a lot of time. Listen, <laughs> you said, a lot of sleepy time for them. Don't worry. They're not going anywhere no time soon. No, see the etymology, get the blue book, the blue letter. I don't know what they even call it. Listen, one day said the blue book. I, well, that, this blue letter, I thought it was the blue book. I'm saying, that's, ain't that where you get cards from? <laughs> said, what, what are you talking about? Wherefore, laying aside all malice and guile, hypocrisies, envies, evil speaking, as newborn babes, desire the sincere milk of the word, that ye may grow thereby. That you might grow thereby. Okay, I don't want no more of this because this is going to take me two more. Okay, let's go back. What was you at again? Philippians. Flipping. Let's finish Philippians real quick. Um, verse 28. The book of Philippians, chapter 2 and verse 28. I sent him, therefore, the more carefully, that when ye see him again, ye may rejoice, and that I may be, that I may be the less sorrowful, receiving him, therefore, in the Lord with all gladness, and hold such in reputation. Hold such in reputation. Read on. 
because of the work of Christ, he was nigh unto death. He was nigh to death for doing God's work. That man you hold to reputation. What was the work he was doing? Trying to build back the nation of Israel. Nation building. These are the relationships you want with people like that. These are the ones that you're going to lay down your life for a brother like that. Or he for you. Everybody following? Watch this. Second, First Corinthians 12. I want 25 through 27. The book of 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 25. That there should be no schism in the body. No what? No schism in the body. There should be no schism in the body. Read on. But that the members should have, have the same care one for another. That the members should have the same care. You can't, members are people that come together, have something into common. And when they have that type of relationship, there should be no schism amongst them. No division amongst them. There should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. Impartial. Read on. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. If one member suffer, then we all suffer together. Now, a lot of times we say it in word, yeah, 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 but our actions don't fall in line with what we say. Yeah, prayer's going up. Prayer's going up. Let's see this type. type. Some hands you emoji. Prayer's going up. They ain't damn sure ain't praying for nobody. You ain't forget. Yeah, who was sick again? When one suffer, we all suffer. Read on. Or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. And when one member is honored, all members rejoice with I lost my place. With Verse. it. Read on. Verse 27. Now ye, are, now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. Now ye are the bodies of Christ, your members in particular. Meaning you're individuals, but you all make up the body of Christ. So when one part of the body rejoice, we all rejoice. When one body, part of the body suffers, we all suffer. We're moving together as one unit. And like that, we cannot be easily broken. So what scripture am I looking for? We cannot be easily broken. Okay, think about it. In the meanwhile, give me Proverbs 17, 17. We cannot easily be broken when we move like this. Yeah, I got that. I know it. I just want Proverbs 17 about brother born for adversity. Seventeen, seventeen, the book of Proverbs, chapter seventeen, and verse seventeen. A friend loveth at all times, and a brother is born for adversity. A true friend is going to love at all times, in good and bad times. And a brother, he was born ready for adversity. A lot of times, you find out your friends when adverse time comes. That's when you find out who you're working with. When it's food, drink, stuff like that, everybody's your friend. You spend the money on them, everybody's your friend. The minute you don't do that, you start telling them, ah, next you know it's a problem. Things go bad for you? No. This number you have reached. Can't reach them. A brother is born for adversity. That's how you know who you're dealing with. You can never judge a situation if you always come out of pocket Nah, that's how you judge your friendships. And adversity is when you're going to find out what you're working with. Just a FYI. What was I asking before? Oh, what was you talking about just before that? Easily broken. Yeah, not easily broken. But bro, what was the thought I was saying in Corinthians? Oh, yeah. When one suffer, all suffer together. Right. Okay. Um... Sir, uh, Ecclesiastes. Oh, I'm sorry. I also I'm waiting for one of them give me the answer. That's it. But watch this. It's four and what? Nine. Okay, watch this. You said it's Ecclesiastes 4, but watch this. 
Watch this. Let me get there with you guys in a second. <laughs> Watch this. Let's start with verse 1. Watch what it says. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 1. So I returned and considered all the oppressions that are done under the sun. And behold, the tears of such as were oppressed, and they had no comforter. And now watch this. Listen what, listen what Solomon is saying. It says, so I returned and considered all the oppression that are, that are done under the sun, and behold, the tears of such as were oppressed. Let's put ourselves in there. Who are the oppressed people? Surely oppression makes a wise man mad. Who are the oppressed people? Okay. It says, so I return and consider all the oppression that are done under the sun, and behold, the tears are such as were oppressed. And they had no comfort, nothing to comfort us. And on the side of the oppressor, there was power. Who is the oppressor today of the earth that rules the earth? Esau. There was power, but they had no comforter. But we had no comforter. Read on. Verse 2. Wherefore, I praise the dead which are already dead more than the living which were yet alive. He said, man, I praise the dead that's already dead than the living that are alive. In other words, well, all this oppression is better off to be dead than go through this. Think of how Solomon is, is seeing this through the spirit. We were ruling the earth. All nations was in subjection to us. David quiet the earth and put all nations under his rule and left it to Solomon. This is the wisest man that, that was on the earth at that time. And in the spirit he's seeing, he said, man, you know what? It's better to be dead than be alive to be under this oppression. We have become comfortable in our depression. In our oppression. We are depressed. Depression too, damn it. We are comfortable being an oppressed people. We are the gods of the earth. We're supposed to be ruling. We should be. If we were infuriated and hated our oppression, we would figure out we must join together. We must be of one mind in the scriptures. Consolidate our thoughts process based on this. Let's do right. Whatever problems we have, let's get past that bullshit. Excuse my language. Because this shit ain't going to keep. We got to get up out of this. Because whatever little beast that we got, this is minor in comparison to us as a people being oppressed. But our problem, you didn't call me. You didn't call me back. You know, I text you. I didn't get the text. Yep. <laughs> to him, take a friggin' mallet. Crack! <laughs> that was my favorite color. It's my favorite color, too. Verse 3. Excuse me. Verse 3. Yea, better is he than both they, which have not yet been, who have not seen the evil work that is done under the sun. Read on. Again, I considered all travail and every right work, that for this a man is envied for his, of his neighbor. Watch what it says. Again, I could, I'm sorry. Verse 3. Yea, yea, better is he than both they which have been, who have not seen the evil work that is done under the sun. Again, I considered all the travail and every right work that for this a man is envy. A man is envy for doing what? For travailing and doing the right work. The world is upside down. The one that's doing right and travailing and laboring, what is it saying about them? It says for that they are envied and hated. Hold this. This is why I want to 1 Corinthians 4. 1 Corinthians 16. First Corinthians 16. Give me verse... 9. Uh, let's go a little higher. Um... 
Start with verse 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 5. Now I will come unto you when I shall pass through Macedonia, for I do pass through Macedonia. And it may be that I will abide, yea, and whether with you, that ye may bring me on my journey, whithersoever I go. For I will not see you now by the way, but I trust to tarry a while with you, if the Lord permit. But I will tarry at Ephesus until Pentecost. So he's laboring, doing the work. Read on. Verse 9. For a great door and effectual is open unto me. He says, what? For a great door and effectual is open unto me. Read on. And there are many adversities. He says. And adversaries. Too. Adversaries. He says. While he's tarrying, he says, I'm going to be here in Pentecost. I mean, I'm going to be in Ephesus to Pentecost. I was in Macedonia. I'm laboring, doing the work. He said, there is a great door and effectual is opening unto me. He said, what does the word effectual mean? Anybody knows? Look it up. Effectual. Uh, give me the synonyms, Cap. Are they got a line? Uh, synonyms. You hit a synonym? Okay, let's what you got, Captain. This is the definition. Uh, effectual, adjective, producing or capable of producing an intended effect, adequate. Valid or binding as an agreement or document. Give me synonyms. Oh, here we go. That's the, that's the synonyms? Valid, authentic, genuine, official, legitimate. Useful. Okay, useful. Where are you looking at? I was looking at this box. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> useful. Oh. Effective. Okay. Useful. Productive. Is the word productive there? Productive. So let's go back to what he's saying here. Verse Nine. Verse nine. For a great door and effectual is open unto me. He says there's a door that's open to him that's productive, that's successful. To get this word out, to push it. There's an avenue open unto me. But guess what? I got adversaries. I got a door open to make a change. We see the oppression happen on people. Here we go. We got we got new arenas to get the word out. But there's adversaries. The adversaries amongst his own people. There should never be an adversary amongst us in here. Unless you're the devil. That's why we can't grow as a people. Because there's adversaries, too many adversaries. So read it one more time. Verse 9. For a great door and effectual is open unto me. And there are many adversaries. Now, if Timotheus come, see that he be with you without fear. He said, now he told the Corinth, if Timotheus come, see he be, without, he be with you without fear. Why would he have to tell him, make sure he's there without any kind of fear? Read on, let's see. Now, if Timotheus come, see that he be, may be with you without fear. For he worketh the work of the Lord, as I also do. He's trying to tell some of you in Corinth that some of you ain't right. So may he be with you without fear. Because he's also working the work of the Lord. Read on. Let no man therefore despise him. He says, don't let any man despise him. So amongst the church there, he had explained to them, listen, I'm saying, I'm saying Timothy there. He's working the work just like me. Make sure there's no fear in there. Nobody's no problems happen with him. It says, let no man in there despise him. Because amongst them in the body, there's adversaries. You want to build something, you got to remove that. That's leaven. There's adversaries. Read on. Let no man therefore despise him, but conduct him forth in peace, that he may come unto me, for I look for him with the brethren. <laughs> it, says, it says, but conduct him forth in peace. He had instructed him, deal with him peaceably. Don't let nobody come in there and start no BS. That he may come unto me, for I look for him. That's how you know we are the people of this Bible. I tell you, I know we are the Israelites. Oh, uh, boy. Read on. Verse, see, I wasn't going to read this far, but read on. Verse 12. 
As touching our brother Apollos, I greatly despaired, desired. desired, excuse me, I greatly desired him to come unto you with the brethren. But his will was not at all to come as at this time. But he will come when he shall have convenient time. He was sent in, but it wasn't a time for him to come. But he'll come when, he's, when it's convenient. Read on. Watch ye. Stand fast in the faith. Quit ye like men. Be strong. Behave yourself like men. Be strong. Watch this. Watch, look what it says. Let all your things be done with charity. Let all things be done with them. It just fits right in. Let all things be done with charity. What is the spirit of charity? Suffer long. It's kind. Not easily provoke. Seeketh not her own. That's how you build the nation. So in relationships are the small little pieces to a bigger puzzle that builds the nations. It's the fiber in which we build the body of Christ. On individual relationship where we're at peace. Where there's no fear of one another. Where there's no schism between each other. And from that it will spring up to the rest of the body. And everybody moving like that. The nation sit back and say, uh oh, this is a wise and understanding people. They'll try to send in infiltrators in here, but it won't work because they won't be able to come in here and dissemble us into murmurings and disputings. They'll try to bring schisms, but it won't work because we all are trying to fulfill Christ's joy. Very simple to build. Just got to remove the nigger out of you. <laughs> less, less nigger, more man of God, and this shit, this stuff will come together. Let's go back. Was there more? No, let's go back. Okay, so we leave off at uh, verse four. Ecclesiastes chapter four and verse four. Again, I considered all travail. And every right work, that for this a man is envied of his neighbor. For doing the work, read on. This is also vanity and vexation of spirit. He said, this is also a waste of time. Read on. Read the on. fool folded his hands together and eateth up his own flesh. Better is an handful with quietness than both the hands full with travail and vexation of spirit. The fool folded his hand together and eateth his own flesh. Here we go. Somebody in the verse before is travailing and every right work, and then you got a fool who folds his hand who ain't doing nothing but destroying. Who ain't doing nothing productive but destroying. A fool will fold his hand and eateth up his own flesh, devour and bite one another and destroy himself. Don't have nothing productive to bring to it, but just come here, complain and nag and, and the negativity and dissemble. It says, better is a handful with quietness, better have a little bit, but there's peace. A handful with quietness, then both hands full of travail and vexation of spirit. So why am I reading all this for? Let's read on. Verse 7. Then I returned and saw vanity under the sun. There is one alone and there is not a second yea he hath neither child nor brother yet is there no end of all his labor he has no child no brother nothing yet there's no end of his labor he's continued working read on neither is his eye satisfied with riches neither shall he neither saith he for whom do i labor and bereave my soul of good this also is vanity yea it is a that, sore travail right he said there's one there's one alone that need, uh, and there's not a second, meaning he's by himself. He doesn't have anybody. It says, yea, sorry, yea, he hath neither child nor brother, yet there's no end of all his labor. Yet he's still working. He has no, he has no end of his labor. It says, neither is his eye satisfied with riches, neither saith he, for whom do I labor? So who is he doing this for? He doesn't say that. And bereave my soul of good, of good, this also is vanity, yea, it is a sore travail. He's trying to tell you, being alone, and all you have, it serves no purpose. You work to have what? 
We do all the things we do for what? For the betterment of your nation. Like I told you, Esau was doing it for his children's children. He was doing it for his brethren. He was breaking his back to leave something in place for them. A man that doesn't have anything to leave in place for nobody, what's the point in doing it? So what's coming together? With with the building blocks on leaving something, a legacy on the earth, we have a purpose of doing it. But you can't do it if you got adversaries amongst you that's looking to tear down what you're building. What's what the next verse say? Verse 9. Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, one will lift his fellow. So two is better than one because you have a reward for it. The reward is what you're going to leave the legacy. It says, for, th- for if they fall, the one shall lift up his fellow. So if I'm so, I got my brother here to help pull me up. My son to pull me up. Me to pull him up. Two is better than one. Read on. But woe to him that is alone when he falleth. But woe to him that's alone when he falls. He has nothing to leave it to. He has nothing that he's trying to build. In this oppression that we're in right now, what does the scripture say? Gather yourself together. A whole nation has not decided before the decree bring forth. He said you're going to have to work together. Work alone and see what you get. There's nobody you can show me nowhere in the Bible. Where not even Christ worked alone. He had 12. Nobody works alone. That's not how God set it up as. And Christ had an adversary amongst him also. <laughs> Read on. For he had not another to help him up. Again, if two lie together, they have heat. But how can one be warm alone? That, it can't be. Drop that. Now remember it says, oh, what's this three-court fold broken? We do. Verse 12. I'm sorry, read on. Verse 12. If one prevail against, excuse me, and if one prevail against him, two shall withstand him. Right, if one try to prevail against him, two will withstand him. Read on. And a three-court, a three-fold cord is not quickly broken. So that oppressor, if he come against one, it's easy. But two they can withstand him, but three cord, one mind we all together, is not easily broken. That's why we're broken today, because guess what? They can kill one of us in the street, open murder, you watch it, you get shot in the back, you get choked out. But we're not joined together. You know what? We all stand individually. Why? Because Beyonce is coming out with the album tomorrow. R. Kelly has his new single he's putting out. There's a new type of Ciroc. There's, there's, you know, LeBron just scored three triple doubles. And everybody's like, oh, we on friggin' lunch break. Then the rest is half the homos, the, the other one's in church, and the, the woman is on whatever she's on, weave. We, we, we. Well, Esau ain't taking it. We like, please. But if we all on, on, on one accord in this Bible, let's, we're, not, we're all not eating pork, we're all not shopping on the Sabbath, we're all not f- selling drugs, we're all not. They're gonna be like, uh oh, the people's woken up. What are wise and understanding people? Okay, the gig is up. As long as that, and then guess what? We'll fight against each other. Dudes is getting played millions of dollars a year, millions of dollars a game to play basketball, and the niggas will fight. You couldn't even get me to fight. What? We have to go cash this check. No, I don't got it's direct deposit. I, pff, fight for, for what? I'm not a boxer. I'm playing basketball. Shit, you pay me to box? Okay. Fight. Look at the nigga. Look at all animals. There you go. Look at him. We ain't going nowhere with that kind of mind. We're going to stay right here forever. Lord forbid. Uh, what was my thought? Three card easily broken. Okay. Uh, back to 1 Corinthians 16. Give me a few more minutes. 16, uh, start with verse 1. We'll read down. 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 1. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given the order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. 
Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay up by him in store, as God has prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. And when I come, whomsoever ye shall approve by your letters, then will I send to bring your liberty, your liberality unto Jerusalem. Your offering. So it says, gather together concerning the churches, do this. They had order. They was able to do it. No strife. Just get it together. Get the money so we can send to Jerusalem. Watch this. It wasn't like what. Well, forget the point was he was able to give instruction. People was able to follow. Here's a point I want to get on top. Uh, jump on down to I uh, read on verse four. And if it be meet that I go also, they shall go with me. Now I will come unto you when I shall pass through Macedonia, for I do pass through Macedonia. And it may be that I will be that I will abide. Yea, and whether with you that ye may bring me on my journey, whithersoever I go. For I will not see you now by the way, but I trust to tarry a while with you, and if the Lord permit. But I will tarry at Ephesus until Pentecost, for a great door and effectual is open unto me, and there are many adversaries. So you can see what he's doing. He's traveling, he's building the nation back up, but there's adversaries. There's always a snake in the grass. Among, there's always a little slimy person that ain't about building, that's about destroying. Let that go. Go to Second Maccabees, the third chapter. Verse one. The book of Second Maccabees, chapter three, verse one. Now, when the holy was the holy city was inhabited with all peace, and the laws were kept very well because of the the godliness of Onassis. The high priest and his hatred of wickedness. So now when the holy city was inhabited with all peace, everything is good. we together. And the laws were kept very well because of the guidance of Onassis, the high priest, and the hatred he had of wickedness. What happens? Read on. It came to pass that even the kings themselves did honor the place and magnify the temple with their best gifts. The kings saw us in order. That's what it says in uh, Jeremiah 15. You keep the commandments, you make your enemies even, your enemies entreat. Hold that real quick. Go to uh, f Jeremiah 15. The book of Jeremiah, chapter 15 and verse 11. Now watch this. Start with verse 10. Verse 10. Woe is me, my mother, that thou hast borne me a man of strife and a man of contention to the whole earth. I have neither lent nor usury. I have neither lent on usury. Nor men have lent to me on usury, yet every one of them doeth curse me. <laughs> look, look what Jeremiah just said. He said, woe is me. My mother has borne me a man of strife. He said, a born amongst us is a man of strife and a man of contention amongst us. He says, uh, to the whole earth, I have neither lent on usury. He said, I never broke the law and lent on usury. It says, nor men have lent me money and charged me. He said, I don't get involved in that. I'm not like that. But as a man born of contention and a man born of strife, he says, yet every one of them doth curse me. He said, damn, I'm doing God's work. I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. I ain't caught up in nothing, but there's a nigger amongst us. And it says, what? Everyone doth curse me. Won't him that Call good evil, evil good. John, uh, Isaiah 5. He said, damn. <laughs> Verse 15. Hey, hey, let me go back. Go back and read Jeremiah. Jeremiah caught hell from his people. I'm telling you now. They gave, they, I'm telling you, Jeremiah was, he was getting to work. I forgot who was the king. My mind escaped me. And they said, we need a prophet. They said, call Jeremiah. I said, no, don't call him. Because he never got nothing good to say about me when I said so, you know, Jeremiah, he didn't hold his tongue. They threw, his, they threw him in a pit in prison. They didn't want to they listen from his own people. They came to Jeremiah for counsel. He gave him counsel. We ain't going to listen to you. So, but you asked me a question. So, I'm not caught up, but they doth curse me. Read on. Verse 11. The Lord saith, Verily it shall be, shall be well with thy remnant. Verily I will cause the enemy to entreat thee well in the time of evil. He says in a time of evil and a time of affliction, he said he will cause the enemy to entreat you well. So let's go back to Maccabees. So now, mind you, 
even though we were keeping the laws during this time, we were in captivity under the nation. We were subject to payments to the other nations. But for the most part, things were good in Jerusalem. Onias had the people in order. Everybody's keeping the commandments. It, we was what they used the word. We was at peace. So there was no strife and contempt. For the most part, we was doing it. To the point that the other nations were sending offerings for the sacrifice for us. So generally, the sacrifice comes from whose pocket? Ours. Our animals, whatever. The other nations were sending it. They, the kings were sending so much, most I put in spirit in them to treat us well, that we had so much bank. Things were so good. And then they rose up a what? A nigga. <laughs> nigga rose up. It's like freaking cockroaches. You see one? There's a hundred behind them. Read on, Cap. Verse 3. Insomuch that Seleucus, the king of Asia, of his own revenues, bear all the costs belonging to the service of the sacrifice. You understand when it says this king bear all the costs to the serving of the sacrifice? That means he was paying for the sacrifices for the nation morning and because you sacrifice twice a day. Every day. Every day you sacrifice twice a day, and I forgot about the high holy days if it was a third time. But the point, every day we sacrifice at least twice a day, and it was a heathen king that bared all the costs for that. So what was happening with all the other stuff we had? We had that stuff on bank. Things was good. But when you see things good, and things all right, and everything goes smooth, here come a nigga with a nigga mind. This nigga happened to be a Benjamite, Lord Jesus. <laughs> You know, you know, Benjamin, they damn miserable backsides. They ain't miserable and just freaking. <laughs> Go ahead. Verse, um, what is it, four, four, right? Yeah. Verse four. But one Simon of the tribe of Benjamin, who was made governor of the temple, fell, fell out with the high priest about disorder in the city. He fell out with the high priest, Onias, about disorder. That's why we fragmented. Because in this time, this was Seleucus. This was before, if you want to keep the Bible or the, the, the Maccabees in chronological order, this man who, Seleucus, he was before Antiochus Epiphanes. This was Antiochus Epiphanes' older brother. Antiochus Epiphanes was a hostage in Rome. When Seleucus died, Antiochus took over. So what happened? Under Seleucus, for the most part, we were at peace ourselves. Onias was got the people keep the laws. We was cool. But there was disorder in the city. Things was rising up. Problems were happening. And then after that, we fragmented. Why? Let's read. Verse 5. And when he could not overcome Onassis. When Simon the Benjamite could not overcome Onassis. Well, damn it. You was the governor of the temple. But Onassis was the high priest of the temple. Why are you in contention with the high priest? You don't run the show. He runs the show. He is the mediator between God and the people. you just the governor. Not saying it's a bad thing. But you ain't the man. He's the man. But you know what? What do we do? Struggling for power, whatever it might be. Read on. And when he could not overcome Onassis, he got him to Apollonus, the son of Theraseus, who then was governor of Celosyria Celosyria and Phoenice. and Phoenice, and told him that the treasury in Jerusalem was full of infinite sums of money. We would listen to me. We are such, we are so gone. Because you're angry at him, you gave up your whole nation to be destroyed. I'm telling you something, boy. We, we, we are the people of the Bible. You couldn't get your way, so you turned the whole nation. Man, you snitched on, oh gosh, it tastes We'll read on. So that the multitude of their riches, which did not pertain to the account of the sacrifices, 
was innumerable. So what happened? We were wealthy. Many of us were wealthy, and we kept the money in the temple. That was like the bank. So not only did you take all the sacrifice what we had, but that he came and took the people's personal money. Now, if this dude was not an enemy of somebody doing good, then I don't know what would be. That's how deep his hatred was. He was blinded by hatred. We became fragmented. What happened from that? Until Shapifis came after that lit. Now we're on a run in the middle of some place. Most I gave some victories, but for the most part, they decimated us. It was just a righteous that scarcely was saved. Well, all praises. But you know the point I'm trying to say. Uh, read on. Was innumerable. That it was possible to bring all into the king's hand. Verse 7. Yeah, chop, chop. Go to chapter 4. A couple more scriptures. I'm about to wrap it up. So when you get a chance to read on your own. 4 and 1. First Mac Second Maccabees chapter 4 verse 1. Now this Simon now of whom we spake afore having been a bereaver of the money and of his country, slandered Onassis. Now, after he went and bereaved the whole nation of their money, he went now and slandered Onassis' name. Read on. As if he had terrified Helodorus and been the worker of these evils. So when you read about Helodorus, this was one of the generals that came in to go retrieve the money. Uh, Helodorus got a severe beating from the angels and... Onassis saved his life, to be honest. But this ungodly wretch went about to go and now bear false witness against him. Read on. Verse 2. Thus was he bold to call him a traitor, that he, deserved, that he had deserved well of the city, and tendered his own nation, and was so zealous of the laws. Read on. But when their hatred went so far that by one of Simon's factions, murmured murderers were committed. So now, because of Simon's hatred, he was able to infect other men's mind that they begin to commit murders. Now you understand the falling part of a nation. Not on one accord. Hatred. It says, wherefore laying aside all malice that you can grow. You don't let go of malice. You don't grow. That they began to commit murders. Of who? Their own people. Read on. Verse 4. Verse 4. Onassis, seeing the danger of this contention, and that Apollonius, as being the governor of Say it again. Celo Syria. Celo Syria and Phoenice did rage and increase Simon's malice. Now watch. Now Onias, seeing the danger of this contention of what's happening, and that Apollonius, as being the governor of Celo Syria and Phoenice, did rage and increase Simon's malice because Simon murmured. He lied. Read on. He went to the king not to be an accuser. Not to be an accuser of his country. He skirted around that and he went to the king. Not to be accused of his country. Read on. But seeking the good of all, both public and private. He, he was trying to seek peace. Because people were being killed. He saw the seriousness of it and said, listen, I got to get around this. I got to find a way. Not saying, well, you know what? Look at him. No, no, we passed it. Listen, it is what it is. God forgive him his dumb behind, but we got to fix this. Because at the end of the day, what's happening? Simon don't care about people dying. He causes, I got to end this that people can live. Read on. Verse 6. For he saw that it was impossible that the state should continue quiet and Simon leave his folly unless the king did look thereunto. He had to go around him to get the king to look into the matter. When you get a chance, read on in it. I want to go from there unto two more scriptures. Isaiah 11. Now in Isaiah 11, um, we read verses. I don't know if I'll read all this. Read verse 13. The book of Isaiah chapter 11 and verse 13. For he saith, by the strength of my hand I have done it. 
And by my no, wisdom. 11, 13? I'm sorry, I'm at 10. Oh. 11 in verse 13. The envy also of Ephraim shall depart, and the adversaries of Judah shall be cut off. Ephraim shall not envy Judah, and Judah shall not vex Ephraim. So when they do this, when this actually happens, there will be what? Unity, there another word, adjective? Peace, right? There will be peace, there will be unity, and when we do that and all that ends, what happens? Unity, peace, and then what happens? The what? Grows and rules, right? Okay. Let's start with verse 1. Verse 1. And there shall come forth a rod. Just remember, the nation shall grow and rule. Read on. And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. That's talking about Christ. Read on. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest (laughs) upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. And shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord. And he shall not judge after the sight of his, of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears. That's why he says, as I hear, I judge St. John's f- f- 5 and 30. He says, my judgment is just because I seek not my own will, but the will of the Father which have sent me. Read on. But with righteousness shall he judge the poor and reprove the iniquity of the, the equity. The equity, excuse me, of the meek. Of the earth and shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked Read on. and righteousness shall be the guide of his loins shall be the girdle and righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins and faithfulness the girdle of his reins the wolf also shall dwell with the lamb and the leopard shall lie, shall lie down with the kid so he says he shall reprove the earth and breath and he shall slay the wicked remove them he said, the righteous shall be the girdle of his loins and the faithfulness, the girdle of his reins, of his mind. It says, the wolf shall what? And the wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf and the, li- the young lion and the fatling together, and the little child shall lead them, and the cow and the bear shall feed. Their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. And the suckling, the sucking child shall play on the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put his hand to the cockatrice's den. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And the day, and in that day there shall be a root of Jesse, which shall stand for an ensign of the people, to to it shall the Gentiles seek, and his rest shall be glorious. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people, which shall be left from Assyria and from Egypt and from Pathros and from Cush and from Elam and from Shinar and from Hamath and from the islands of the sea. And he shall set it up an ensign for the nations and shall assemble the outcasts of Israel together Together the dispersed and and gather the together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. The envy also of Ephraim shall depart, and the adversaries of Judah shall be cut off. Ephraim shall not envy Judah, and Judah shall not vex Ephraim. So we just read all that. So Christ is gonna come, he's the branch. He says, He will slay the wicked. The wolf shall dwell with the lamb, the leopard shall lie down with the kid. He gave all these analogies of these animals that was cohabitating together. Those animals were at peace, right? Okay. He says, and then it shall come to pass, that's when he will gather his children together, out of scattered together. Ephraim shall not envy Judah, nor Judah vex Ephraim. They're going to be at, and then what happens? Need the next verse. Verse 14. But they shall fly upon the shoulders of the Philistines toward the west. They shall spoil them of the east together. They shall lay their hands upon Edom and Moab. And the children of Ammon shall obey them. Read on. And the Lord shall utterly destroy the tongue of the Egyptian sea. And with his mighty wind shall he shake his hand over the river. And shall smite it in the seven streams. 
and make men go over dry shod. And there shall be an highway for the remnant of his people, which shall be left from Assyria, like as it was to Israel in the day that they came out of the land of Egypt. So the Lord said, in the day when Ephraim and Judah ends it, when there's peace amongst us, we're moving together, he's going to defend us. We're going to fly upon the shoulders of the Philistines. Worstward, they shall spoil them of the east together. They shall lay hand upon Edom and Moab, and the children of Adam shall obey us. But first, the enmity must cease. We must come back as a nation. Relationships are the keys to building back a nation of people. Or God is not dealing with us. You will stay in the niggard mind as long as we don't figure this stuff out. But until we do that, we cannot do the second part and rule of the nation. Do you understand that? Okay, let's go from that. One more scriptures. Yeah. Yeah, please. Yeah. Very briefly, I'd like to uh, read two scriptures real quick. You know, I really like the, the Jeremiah 15 um, and 10. <laughs> I, I got to throw that one in the arsenal. That was a very, very good hot pocket scripture. This, this entire class, to me, I got a lot out of it. Very profound, excellent class. Um, but when we were reading back in Jeremiah 15 and 10, right, where it said, Woe is me, my mother, that thou hast borne me a man of strife and a man of contention to the whole earth. I have neither lent on usury, nor men have lent to me on usury, yet every one of them doth curse me. As soon as he said it, it struck a nerve because it, it was going back to what uh, Paul was saying. Great opportunities but you have to be able to get past the adversary. Christ, he said something in, that, in my mind that was very reminiscent of that, uh, from quoting from Jeremiah 15 and 10. Let's look at Matthew chapter 7 and verse 6. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 6. Now, in terms of the deeper meaning behind this scripture, not exactly going to draw from, but the day-to-day practicality in practice i want to pull from a lesson that christ is saying in this verse read the book of matthew chapter 7 and verse 6 give not that which is holy unto dogs neither cast ye your pearls before swine lest they trample them under feet under their feet and turn again and rend you okay so when the scripture says neither cast your pearls before swine right again not looking at it deep the practicality of it in this essence would be there's something good that's in your possession that you have the power through the Lord to impart to someone else. The scripture says, don't cast your pearls before swine. In this case, the swine, you could think about it in terms of the person that's not going to receive it when you give it. It says, don't cast your pearls before swine lest they trample them under their feet. In other words, take the good things that you're giving and they destroy it. It comes to naught. They're not going to do anything good with it. No different than under Jeremiah's time. Here it is, Jeremiah's doing the work, but he's dealing with a stiff-necked, rebellious, ungodly people who had a nigger spirit that hated him because of the good that he was trying to impart. Here it is, you got wicked men, wicked women, all throughout the habitations, doing evil left and right. This person sinning doing this, this person sinning doing that. Here Jeremiah comes and says, okay, here's the antidote. Here's the solutions. But Jeremiah's the one that's cursed, even though he's not trying to do nothing grimy by a person. It says, don't cast your pearls before swine unless those people trample the pearls under their feet. And it says, and turn again and rend you. That's what Christ is saying about those adversaries. He's saying that the adversary, the way that you'll know an adversary is when you try to impart that pearl before them, they're not going to stand back and say, well, damn, it's a million other people in Jerusalem. This is the only guy giving me the pearl. Blessings to you. The adversary will look and say, F your pearl. 
Now, everybody else in the land who's just sitting there just seeing you impoverished, you're buddy buddies. Everything is all good in the hood. But when somebody comes and gives you the pearl, that's the one that you're going to trample under the feet. And then it says it's going to turn again and rend you. In other words, the word rend means to tear violently. So when you hand off the pearl, it's not going to be, oh, okay, well, thanks for the pearl. It's going to be they're going to destroy your pearl. Then they're going to go off on you as if you handed them a pile of dung. And that's one of the main things that really going to the bishop's class when it comes to relationships, that's one of the things that we really have to be able to understand. Having the spirit of discernment to be able to see when the pearls are being handed to you, how do you receive it? What is your mindset? How do you go about actually unifying with the brother or the sister that's trying to do good by you? You know what I mean? There was one thing that I was always taught growing up. Don't bite the hand that feeds you, right? And sometimes I think that misses a lot of people in the truth because the sermon would tell you, okay, well, think about your circle. Think about who's doing good by you. If people are doing good by you, you want to take that and keep it rolling. You want to keep building upon that. But a lot of times we may be so into ourselves, vaunting ourselves, thinking our own, that we may not even recognize, okay, when I'm in this particular circle or I'm with this particular person, things are on an up and up for me. You're so much into your own course and your own mind, you don't even recognize, damn, when I was in this with this person, I ain't good. Now that I'm cutting ties with this person, I'm about to starve to death. But I think that I know how to go out and fish. I think I know how to go out and eat, but I don't because I'm always in my own mind. So that's the reason why we got to be very mindful as we build these relationships to be able to really understand, okay, how do I unify with my fellow brother or my fellow sister so that way we can build? Because I cannot do it by myself. And in order to do that, it takes humility. I want to read this real quick, Sirach chapter 25 and verse 8. In order for us to be able to see each other in that manner, we have to look at one another and esteem one another better than ourselves. We got to be able to look at a brother or look at a sister and look at the gifts that they have and say, this brother or sister has this spirit, this is a gift, and this is a strength that they have greater than I. Because if you don't have that mindset and you can't see the, the good in a brother or the sister that's right among you, you're going to miss out because all of the gifts that they could have imparted on you or the body or the nation, you're never actually going to make use of because you don't see the good that's in them. Let's read that real quick. Sirach chapter 25 and verse 8. The book of Sirach chapter 25 and verse 8. Well is him that dwelleth with a wife of understanding. Now, when you notice these three characteristics, right, these three different scenarios, all of these things surround unity. They all surround harmony. The scripture says, well is him that dwelleth with a wife of understanding. Because if you dwell with a wife that has understanding, then that means that a husband and wife are going to agree together so that way their prayers are not hindered. The nation building starts at the home. How can a man rule a church if he can't take care of his home? Your first adversary really starts at home. That's what Christ said. A man's foes should be that of his own house. So the scripture says, in unity, well is him that dwelleth with a wife of understanding. Read. Well is him that dwelleth with the wife of understanding and that hath not slipped with his tongue. And have not slipped with his tongue. Why? Because as you converse among your fellow brother or your fellow neighbor, you don't want to say anything that will disconnect the harmony or the unity that's at play. So that's the reason why the scriptures is talking about having sound speech so that way brothers can connect without it being a falling out of words. Read on. And have not served a man more unworthy than himself. Now that's the thing. In order for us to really build the nation in unity, we have to humbly acknowledge 
that we're not serving among those that are more unworthy than ourselves. We've got to be able to look at the brothers and the sisters in this truth that have come before us and say, you have greater strengths, greater experience, wisdom that has not yet been imparted on me because I haven't had those travels. I humbly acknowledge and submit myself to you so that way the nation can grow. If you don't have that type of mindset and that type of mentality, the nation's not going to grow because anytime you see someone that is over you or someone that the Lord is sending to you to try to help you, you're never going to allow them to bring forth their gift because you're always going to say, no, you're teaching. No, I can teach better. No, you did this. You made this sandwich. No, I can make the sandwich better. When in actuality, you can't do that, but your head is so far up your anus, you can't actually see the gift that your brother or sister has and how you could be better by humbling yourself to extract the gifts that they're able to give. So the only way that the nation can be built is if we all take the stance of humility and say, this is my elder. I humble myself to the experience and wisdom of this man. And the minute that stops, that's when a nigga comes and will be here for another 100, 200 years. I won't, I'll be dead, but I'm going to shoot you. Um, very good, very good. Um, so the whole point behind it was when we read in um, Isaiah at the end of it, it was as we come together as a nation in peace, move the strife and contention, we work together as a unit, is when we're going to rule over the nations. Unto Christ shall the gathering of the people be. Yes, soldier. Mm -hmm. uh, we were ruling over everything, yes. Uh, well, we'll say. When I say we, I don't want to mean us as a nation because we wasn't a nation at that point. But uh, th that godly seed, which we sprang out of, uh, was the rulership of all things. Um, but then, I mean, well, you know what? To be honest with you, now as I think about it, I like the example because we were in order and the problem happened when? when we, After the first sin. Huh? After the first sin. The point, the problem of the sin was that Eve thought she can be equal with Adam and be a god like him. And that began the ruin of us, not staying in our order not working together cohesively, you know. We all have a part to play in this, in this body. But the point was that we, when we work in any relationship, friendships or marriages, as a congregational relationships, that we all are moving on one accord. There shouldn't be schisms to the point, or there shouldn't be problems to the point that they go unresolved or not able to fix because that begins dissension. And with that, you cannot build a nation of people. So I played it to this class was edifying. You received something from it today. Um, and take her home and meditate on the scriptures and let's build this Shalom this is Bishop Nathaniel of Israel United in Christ please subscribe to our YouTube channels stay up to date with our latest events music and classroom lessons IUIC plans to continue visiting different countries where this gospel has not been preached before. IUIC needs your help in pushing this truth. So join us. Subscribe to our Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and podcast, and stay up to date with us. For more information, please visit www.israelunite.org.